together, to share in faith, and as we draw closer to the Lenten season, and as we continue our journey through John's Gospel, open our hearts and minds to receive your wisdom. Especially with difficult sayings, especially where we struggle and wrestle, help us to surrender to your grace and guide our conversation as we pray, Hail Mary, O Lord, 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 the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, the Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For those of you who take notes, and I know people approach this in different ways, some people are what I would call advanced scholars who've been at this number of decades, some people new to it, some people like to take notes, some people just listen, some people are more academically advanced, some people um, <coughs> catch what we can. However you do it, just note that again, as we're finishing the end of chapter 7 today, going into chapter 8, this is another section that only appears in John's Gospel. The vast bulk, 85 or 90% of what we've read so far, if you're checking with it, linear scripture book, it, it's unique to John's gospel, it just stands alone. So what we discussed today will also include that. Um, I, I heard, I, I saw a video recently where there was, a, there was a debate between Christianity and Islam of scholars, and uh, I'm not, a, of all the major religions of the world, I know the least about Islam, but one of the claims in Islam is that they believe everything that's in the Bible. They consider the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, to be sacred scripture. And this, this, one of the Christian scholars of this exchange or symposium, I guess you'd call it, he said, if you believe everything that's in the Bible, why don't you believe that Jesus was God? And they said, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. He's a great prophet. And the Christian scholar said, no, it says many places in uh, in the Bible, he's God. And I found it odd. I think he was an Anglican professor, but he quoted one line from John's Gospel, and I thought to myself, I, I agree with that quote as an example that illustrates Jesus claiming he's God. But I can, I can point, I think, to thousands of examples in John's Gospel. I hope you've been hearing up to now how many times we point out that uh, Jesus is saying he's divine. Uh, I don't know why he, why his reading was had to, had a more narrow focus, but the last few days since the feeding of the multitudes, we've given many examples of Jesus again claiming he's divine, he's from heaven, he, he's the only one who knows God, he's equal to God the Father, um, and he left everyone in a stupor last time. That's why that's where we ended. And some of the people, you know, their anxiety, their anger got worked up more and more, and they threatened to make sure he was going to get arrested. So where we left it was they, they sent for temple guards. If you didn't know, in the temple grounds at the time of Jesus, they had their own police department. They had their own orphanage too, their own school, their own, there were a lot of institutions based on it. But one temple guards had a, basically a police office there in the temple. So you didn't have to go very far to get them. And the officers showed up but instead of arresting him, they listen to him. And they are stunned, and they find that they can't arrest him. Just their conscience, it's a conflict of conscience. It's a good example in scripture of um, conscientious objectors. They refuse to carry out the order given them by the, by the Sadducees. That's what we're picking up, which is chapter 7, verse 45, if you have your Bible. Okay? Just a couple things to highlight as we close out seven. Um, the officers then went back to the chief priests and Pharisees. When they say, by the way, sometimes the uh, nomenclature changes, but if you say chief priest, just so you're clear, that means Sadducee. Because the Sadducees were temple officials. They considered themselves the priestly class of the temple. Pharisees were synagogue leaders. Street preachers. They were kind of a different kind. Um, so when it says chief priests and Pharisees, it's the Sadducees and Pharisees basically are involved in this. Um, and the officer said to them, 
of the, the excuse me, the chief priest of Pharisees said, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. And the Pharisees answered them, are you led astray, you also? Man, I gave you a little job and you, you screwed it up already. Um, they're baffled. Uh, have any of the authorities or of the Pharisees believed in him? So kind of an air of superiority. We were not taken in by his preaching style. How come you're not smarter like us? Uh, but this crowd who do not know the law are cursed. Basically, they call him, everybody in the crowd, idiots. Because you're on school, you're not seeing through the lies. You should, you should be able to more quickly identify uh, Jesus as the false prophet, basically, they're saying. But here, ta -da, Nicodemus makes his second appearance in John's Gospel. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, meaning he was a member of the Sanhedrin, he's a I don't know if he was a Sadducee or a Pharisee, but he was of the highest rank of rabbi. Um, he said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? So he's advocating for actually the due process under the law. You're, you want to be judge, jury, and executioner all at once, but even in our Jewish law, there's a process. You can bring someone in for a trial, you can hear them out, you can listen to witnesses. Um, he's basically saying, let's have cooler heads. Let's, let's follow the process that we have available to us. Um, so again, in 51, he says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? <laughs> now they're calling their colleague an idiot. Basically, oh, you're so gullible. The, the reputation in Jerusalem of the people of Galilee was rednecks. <laughs> a bunch of country rednecks who don't know anything. Um, search, and you will see that no prophet is to rise from Galilee. That's the level of their pride and confidence in their knowledge of Scripture. And yet, they're wrong. <laughs> because, I, I think I pointed out last time, there's a, a debate, Rose, this will be now the third time we eventually today we'll hear it again. A debate around where is this Jesus from? What do we know of him? And some say, well, according to the scripture, he should be from Bethlehem, from David City. But we know he's not from there, he's from Nazareth. So people are misinformed. When if they had just stopped to ask, maybe a blunt question, by the way, Jesus, where were you born? They might be shocked. But, uh, they think, well, he's from Nazareth, so he doesn't fulfill that. Uh, some who are not mentioned in this passage, but they existed, said he, the Messiah with the capital M should come out of Egypt in the manner of Moses. In all things, he should be Moses-like. And to their knowledge, well, he's an Israelite. But if they would have just asked, they would have discovered the Holy Family went into Egypt as refugees, and he did come out of Egypt. And some more modern scholars would say, you know, uh, there is a balm in Gilead, you know that song, uh, that the, the land of Zebulon and Naphtali will be the first, you know, the consolation of God. It's more of a vague prophecy, but actually it indicates that God's blessing, his good news will first come from Galilee. They just didn't know how to read that passage, but scripture does speak of it. And then there's a fourth camp that says, actually, Scripture says, it will remain a mystery. No one will know where he's from. But it, they're debating between the Bethlehem prophecy and the no one knows where he would come from. Because the, the officials say, but we know where he comes from. He comes from Nazareth. So he can't be the Messiah. They're actually trying to work it out from what they know of Scripture. Maybe a little too overly confident, but... And his, as you know, his counter-argument is, well, actually, you don't know where I come from because I come from heaven. And I come from the Father, and you apparently don't know the Father. And you can't know heaven because you have to die to know it, to go there. Um, so actually, you don't know where I'm from. So in a strange way, four different prophecies that seem to be in conflict about where he's from, and Jesus is the one unique person who fulfills all four of them. 
Um, but anyway, Nicodemus points for Nicodemus, and during the passion, he'll argue again, give this guy a trial, come on. Well, let's hear from him. He deserves that right, you know, to make his case. Uh, anyway, that's where it's left. And it says, uh, after that, they each went to their own house. So even though he's stirring up tension, no one seemed to have the courage to arrest him. And John, every time, eventually will say, the reason is because his hour has not yet come, that Jesus is totally in control. You know, when he goes to Nazareth and they try to throw him off a cliff, he just walks through the crowd. Mm -hmm. As though to say, you don't have any power or you can't kill me. My time's not yet. I'm, I control the universe. Um, any, anyway, uh, comments about that little bit of the end of seven? Wasn't Jesus a Roman, a Roman citizen? No, no. You may be thinking of St. Paul. St. Paul, in his letters, makes a point that he didn't have to purchase Roman citizenship. He was born a Roman citizen. And for that reason, they have not a lot of special advantages, but one of their advantages is if you're going to be executed by the government, you can be beheaded rather than crucified. So at least beheading is swift, theoretically painless. Although hard to imagine they separated from your body. But the way they did it, relatively merciful compared to crucifixion, which was the most humiliating and painful of deaths. Um, so he was beheaded about it, whereas St. Peter was crucified. Dan? Dan Kazmaka, I see your hand. Are you, do you have a thought or are you stretching? I'm just expressing it. A reflection of your comment. Okay. Say, 
There may be others, but there are reasons why the historic church overruled one over another. Because maybe I have a hundred copies that say this, and I have one copy that says that. It might be just sheer numbers when they came up with these hand copied things. Who knows? But we have the one we have. Yeah. Good question, though. Well, here in this discussion, and Steve raised a uh, book on John, he does say the early Greek manuscript, none of them have this story. All of the Latin ones do, which are a little later. Yeah. And then eventually, everybody, all the major saints from that time and the early church fathers believed in that story. Yeah. And the so Council of Trent said the Vulgate is scripture, and yeah. what's there is there. It's a process of collaboration of the, the sense of the faithful, the scholars, especially St. Jerome, yeah. big default to him, translating everything into one common language. But ultimately, it comes down to the guidance of the magisterium, which is kind of like the imprimatur, the this is the official copy. Yeah. And to, to accept that ultimately is an act of faith. You have to say, how can this one not work not over another one? Well, how come we have seven sacraments and not eight? How come we have the mass? I mean, if, if you question everything, yeah. essentially not that with faith, then we're in a world of hurt. Because I've always said, Christianity is too crazy of a religion. I could never invent it. <laughs> so <there's laughs> But I choose to believe, you know, that act of faith. Okay. They did say in here that maybe the reason the Greek people did not translate this is they thought it was scandalous. It was too lenient on the woman caught in adultery for that time. That oh, it was too lenient. Totally and they left it out on purpose. There could be a lot of possible reasons. Some of it is language snobbery. Yeah. For instance, in the Old Testament, why does the Catholic Bible have seven more books than the Protestant Bible? Because these seven books were originally written uh, in Greek rather than Hebrew. And the rabbis of Palestine said, you can't be holy then if it wasn't written in Hebrew. <laughs> it's like my seminary professor, one of them, she said, you know, in heaven we will all speak Greek. <laughs> <laughs> we can have our preferences. <laughs> Pick up on chapter 8. So they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. If you've ever been, how many people just quick show of hands have been to Jerusalem? Okay, like a quarter. You know, Jerusalem's kind of built on some bridges. Which strangely they call mountains. I cannot. A self-respecting person from Montana cannot go to mountains. And I have the Rocky Mountains out you know, outside of my bedroom window. There are bridges, hills, steep hills, but that is the topography of Jerusalem. And near the the east gate that would open into the temple area, there's one of those little ridges, like Ruffles Head Ridges. The valley part of it is called the Kidron Valley. It's where the Grove of Olives is, the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you go up the next three edge, it's called the Mount of Olives. And you can walk, you can start on the top, which we had a chance to do, and take a little switchback highway. And it's, it's not a short walk, an hour and a half maybe. Um, you do drop down and smell to it's steep, and then you come up. But it's just right outside the uh, temple area. So he left the temple grounds and went up to the top of the hill to pray. And then he came back the next day, is what we're telling him. Um, and then early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Points for him because he goes right back into the, the lion's den. You know, a lot of tension was being stirred up. And he goes right back to it. That's a pretty persistent person. I can try to imagine from the temple officials' perspective, like, you gotta be kidding me, that guy's back. He doesn't go away. Um, that I say all this by way to, again, maybe recapture some of the strangeness of Jesus, the shock value that this guy is saying challenging and weird things that it's not easy to process. Um, 
the scribes and the Pharisees, so again that means the Sadducees and the Pharisees, brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, he commanded us to stone such. What did you say about her? This they said to test him. So John is very clear. I understand the motive. It's an underhanded thing that's being done here. It's not, it's not a sincere question of the law. They're trying again to trip him up. And at this point in Jesus' life, every encounter with the Sadducees and the Pharisees is a trap. One trap after another. Just trying to find grounds to kill them legally or at least throw them in prison. Make them go away through the coercive force of the law. Uh, so they asked him, what should we do with her? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the eldest. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. It's a beautiful story. A um, couple things to point out. And then I'm interested if I miss any. But no, the first one he was the eldest. That is, uh, hopefully that's a suggestion of the wisest. Yes. Saw the folly first and said, this is a dumb idea, guys. Uh, you caught us in our own trap. And in truth, we are all guilty of sin. You know, we're hypocrites. And it's as plain as day. So they dropped their stones. Oh, there's a joke, by the way, about this. You probably heard it. Not meant to be scandalous, but, you know, this, this scene unfolds. And Jesus says, uh, let, let the first uh, among you without sin cast the first stone. And a little pebble flies out of the crowd. And Jesus looks over and says, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple of things. Uh, you know, some of you were, I, I did preach once in Ash from last weekend, but I also, when I did preach in English, I was trying to point out that um, with the, what seems like on the surface a crazy story of Jonah, the guy being swallowed by a fish, but it actually has great allegorical value. That early Christians, in that case of that story, um, pointed out that when God makes his will clear to you, and you refuse to follow through with it, it causes chaos, it causes suffering for you and for others, because there's always a link to love of neighbor, and if you're, if you're not following through in what God calls you to, people lose, the church loses as a result, because somebody doesn't speak up, somebody doesn't step up, somebody doesn't lead. And uh, the, the detail I found most interesting allegorically was the fish, or the whale, um, that some early Christians read that as God is the Lord of all creation, and the fish being a member of creation, sort of God's ambassador in this situation, represents God's will, and that you can't escape from God. Um, yeah, in, in the case I gave, it's like, for those who say God doesn't speak to me, uh, the conscience. You can try to stop praying. You can try to stop reading the Bible. You can do like I did, uh, move to Japan, to a Buddhist country. <laughs> Guess what? Your conscience is inside you. It's not going anywhere. You can't, you can't get away from it. Um, there are allegorical readings of this story, too. One of them, I, from my footnotes, it's involving St. B. And he points out this kind of interesting thing. So it says, um, from verse 6, if I went back to verse 6, it says, 
Uh, this thing he said to test him, da da da. Then it says Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And then again, uh, in verse 8, it says, And once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. So between the same, St. Pete says, Whenever you're reflecting on someone else's sin, you should be doubly humble. You should bend down to the ground before and after and make certain you are also not guilty of the same sin. You know, there has to be a humility that better go with that task. So that's one early allegorical reading of the story that I found kind of interesting. Um, yes? One reading I saw, um, heard was that they were saying that he was actually writing their sins down. Yeah. And they started writing, and then as people saw their own sins, I have heard that as a common thing that he could read their souls, if you will, and know all the sins of their life. I found this interesting, though, in this footnote. I've never heard this one before. Um, it says that when Jesus inscribes in the dirt, uh, what he what he writes is unknown, but probably symbolic of Jeremiah seventeen. <laughs> Verse 13, because just before this passage, he was calling himself the living water. And so some scholars think there's a link with that. And in Jeremiah 17, verse 13, it's, uh, it says, as a warning for those who forsake the Lord, that they shall be written in the earth. Meaning, um, you know, if you don't come around to believing in me, you will die in your sin. There's, there's only damnation waiting for you don't repent and convert. So it might literally be a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy that, uh, you know, if your heart is not softened, if it remains like a stone, then you're written in the dirt means not good. Either way, it's not good, because if he's writing your sin or he's saying, without me, you're condemned, um, it, uh, it's not, you don't want to change places with him. Put it that way. <laughs> okay. And um, I think the, the last reaction I have is from today. The, if you weren't at daily mass today, today was the, the memorial mass of St. Francis de Sales. And I think of him. He's one of the doctors of the church. Um, his official title of the church is um, Friend of Kindness. <laughs> I'm like, sign me up for that title. <laughs> Pretty good title. If, if, if in the twilight of light, we are measured by love alone. That's a pretty good statement. But he, he was a, a bishop during the Protestant Reformation in Switzerland, in which Calvinism took off, which is a more ancient form of modern-day Presbyterian church. And they had a teaching of predestiny, which is a bit different from ours when we use that word. Uh, Calvin believed that some people were created for hell and some people were created for heaven. According to God's plan. So predestined to fail or succeed, and you couldn't do anything about it. If you're predestined to go to hell, you'd be like, I wish you didn't create me. Then if that's the case. But he uh, in his younger days, he had been exposed to this kind of preaching and he became convinced he's going to hell. And he became neurotic and just very filled with fear and anxiety. And because of this and long years of suffering. Ultimately, he concluded that that was a lie and that um, you can't coax people to God using fear, like beat them over the head with a stake. It has to be love. And so he became a saint of gentleness. And uh, I think this, this story sort of is harmonious with St. Francis de Sales. Jesus is saying, I don't condemn you. you know, we, have, we believe that people who are in hell are there by their own choice. God doesn't send you to hell. If you literally go out of this world and say, God, leave me alone. Well, guess what? God will honor that. But that's not a place you want to be. Left apart from God, because God is the source of all goodness and blessing. So you're about to go to a place where there's no goodness or blessing. But it's what you wanted. Leave me alone, God. And, uh, so some theologians say, if the door to hell is locked, it's locked on the inside. <laughs> Sad, but he he shows us an image of mercy right there. Go and sin no more, basically. Um, 
other reactions or comments about it? Tony? Um, I've got a St. Joseph version that says, avoid the sin. Yeah. I like that better because it seems a little more practical. That's but true. Avoid that sin versus sin no more, but historically that was her. Yeah, that's true. Uh, go, you know, avoid this sin. That's it. Kind of corresponds with our sacrament of reconciliation, where we say uh, to, to avoid the near occasion of sin. That not only are we going to try to avoid the sin, but I shouldn't even be in that neighborhood. If I'm walking in that direction, and I know without being too much of a prophet, if I keep walking this way, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going into a minefield. So we're promising that we'll even try to avoid the near occasion of sin. We should. She's still clear of it. But that's essentially what he's saying to her. Okay, so let's pick up from verse 12 now. This is where we get the second I am statement. So the first one, if you recall, from the feeding of the multitude is, I am the bread of life. Now the second one will be, I am the light of the world. That's in this, this passage here in chapter 8. So we read, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The, and, and you'll see just confusion ensues. Uh, the Pharisees then said to him, you're bearing witness to yourself. Your testimony is not true. It's because you're not citing someone else as a witness. And Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness to myself, my testimony is true. <laughs> for I know where I come from and where I'm going but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going it's basically saying I don't just tell the truth I am the truth with a capital T so I don't really need to follow your your test list there but he says you judge according to the flesh I judge no one kind of reiterating what he did with the woman caught in adultery uh, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone that judge, but I and he who sent me. In other words, he said, where two or three testify that there's truth, he's saying, there is two. There's me and there's the Father. And in other passages we've already read, he said there's the Spirit, there's blood and water, there's John the Baptist, there's, he lists a bunch of things, Scripture, Moses, um, but in this case, he just gives the two. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I bear witness to myself, and the Father, who sent me, bears witness to me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? They think he's referring to the human father. By then, we think Joseph has passed away, but that's who they would have understood his father to be. But where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. The, the main point he's trying to make, and he says he repeats this like six or seven times, is basically this. The godly will recognize God. The ungodly will never recognize godly things. And, and he's basically saying to his opponents, you're ungodly. So you won't know my father, and you, you don't recognize me either because you're ungodly. You, you have evil in your heart. So your eyes can't see clearly. Um, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So again, he takes control, and the people, they're not happy, but they, they don't know what to do with it just yet. And then we continue from verse 21. Again, he said to them, I go away, and you will seek me and die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. This is, uh, I don't know if you recall, but going back a few weeks, this is now the second time he said this. Where I'm going, you cannot come, which is in direct contrast to the Last Supper. When he tells the apostles, where I'm going, you will follow. And it's Thomas who said, and I only know Thomas because it's a common funeral for you. Thomas says, uh, we don't know where you're going, how the heck are we supposed to follow you? <laughs> and uh, Jesus gives the famous line, I am the way truth and the life. Whoever follows me will not perish, but have eternal life. Um, that's his answer. But he, he offers 
the apostles away because they're godly and they can they can recognize the things of God. But to these his enemies, he says, "Where I'm going, you can't come." But you don't want to hear from Jesus because where is he going? Heaven. And if you can't come there, you're in trouble. Um, he brings that up again. Where I'm going, you can't come. He said to them, "You are from below. I'm from above." You are of this world, I am not of this world. Pause for a moment and think if you're having such a conversation with someone in the streets of Edward. I'm from above, you from here. <laughs> what kind of drug are you on? <laughs> or you have some, are you still taking your prescription? <laughs> you know, we dismiss it because, man, what is this guy saying? Um, I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins unless you believe that I'm He. They said to him, Who are you? Now it's getting to a better question. Because that's the question Jesus also asks when he turns to the apostles. Who do the people say that I am? And then the kicker, yeah, but who do you say that I am? That's the ultimate question each of us cannot get around. Your parents can't answer that for you, your neighbor can't answer that for you. Sometime in this life, you have to come up with the compelling answer. And hopefully, it's Jesus is God, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. You know? If not, we can't save ourselves. So, we have to get to that question. And here they're finally saying, Who back is this guy? So they asked him bluntly, directly, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Even what I have told you from the beginning, I have much to say about you and much to judge. He who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what is pleasing to him. As he spoke to us, many believed in him. But others would be really confused. And I don't know if you ask the same question as me. I give myself permission to ask any question I want, even if it sounds irreverent or unpolite. I can't help but ask the question, Jesus, if you want more people to believe in you, why are you just, why are you answering all these riddles? Why do you need to give a clear answer? This is hard. I mean, you could clear up a lot of things if you had answered a little more directly. But I guess he wants us to search for him um, and wrestle. I don't know. I don't know to conclude. That's a that's a good question without an answer yet for me still. Um, but two things I guess I would point out. He says it in this place and in several places before now and all throughout. He came to do his father's will. That's from the start. Uh, obedient unto the cross, all the way to the cross. That is his vocation, to do the Father's will, to give the Father glory. And for that reason, the Father wants to give the Son glory, because he was faithful to the end, he was successful, he didn't sin at all. Um, the second thing, though, is a, rem a reminder, it says that, let me go back to what it says about the Father. Uh, he has not left me alone. To understand the mysterious relationship of the Trinity. Even though the second person of the Trinity is incarnate, there is this perfect ongoing union with the Trinity. This is important to understand because when Jesus on the cross says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people think, Oh, now, now he skipped down. God the Father abandoned him. That's not the meaning. He's actually quoting the first line of the song. Psalm 22, I believe. And if you read Psalm 22 in its, in its entirety, that's a rabbinic way of quoting a song. It's like, if I said, Mary had a little lamb, I'm talking about the whole poem. If I said, let's pray to our Father, I'm saying the first two words, but you know I'm referring to the whole prayer. Or the Hail Mary, or the Glory Be, or the Creed, which is the first words I believe. Um, he's quoting the first line of Psalm 22, which... It's a very prophetic description of the situation. My enemies are surrounding me. 
You can count all my bones. My mouth is so dry. My tongue is sticking to the roof of my mouth. They put holes in my hands and feet. He's describing the crucifixion. And then he feels, it looks like to others as though he was a failure and has abandoned God. But in the last final verse of Psalm 22, he says, but you didn't abandon me. You, you were with me. You, you raised me up. Your faith was again. He, he wasn't abandoned. And he's never been abandoned. He never will be abandoned because it's the Trinity. Three persons, one unity. Make sense? Um, thoughts, comments? Yeah. So, Father, the people that have come to the temple have followed him. Yeah. They've seen his miracles. Yeah. Less about himself, though it's kind of yeah. I mean, it's 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 perfect. Yes, perfect. Sure, but um, for those that are have not seen the miracles and are hearing this, yeah, it probably sounds earthly. So he's actually dealing with two groups of people, is he not? Well, keep in mind one thing, though. If we go back a week, he's in the exact same place where the pool of Siloam is. The pool of Siloam is like a block away where he healed crippled men. Everybody in Jerusalem heard word that he did this. That's, we, we mentioned the last time when he was down there and then he returned from Dovermich. He was famous in Galilee for the miracle he did in Jerusalem. So I'm assuming everybody's at least heard of these kinds of miraculous events. But yeah, if you were only listening to his words, I would think you'd have no choice but to be confused. Yeah. Kind of like the Everybody says there is one, but until you see it, yeah, you're not there you go. It. It's, it's a lot to take in, for sure. Uh, so we continue from verse 31. It says, uh, Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him. So there is a definite division in the crowd. Some are starting to be more and more convinced that he's the Messiah. Others are getting more and more angry and separated. The army of light and darkness is kind of separating out. Um, so it says uh, the Jews who had believed in him they said if you continue in my word you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free they answered him we are uh, now these are the opponents we are descendants of Abraham and have never been in bondage to anyone that's the silliest statement of um, in the whole gospel, I think. Even if you know only a small modicum of Jewish history, you know that the Jews were slaves for nearly 500 years in Egypt, 450 years. What do you mean you've never been enslaved to anyone? If you're a descendant of Abraham, then you were in slavery in Egypt. I don't know why they're overlooking that, but that's their strong reaction when he's talking about, I will set you free. Like, Wait a minute, you're calling us slaves. I'm listening closely. They get offended by that. Um, we've never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will make us free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So I think from that line, he's clarifying. I'm not talking about legal slavery here, being in chains. I'm talking about spiritual slavery. If you're, if you're committing sin, you're a slave to that sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're a descendant of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. So he's letting him know, I know some of you are plotting, you won't be dead. I'm aware of it. Uh, I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do, and you do what you have heard from your father. Here, here comes the big stinger. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to him, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You do the works of your father. Which father is he talking about? Satan. 
He's saying, you're children of Satan, not children of Abraham. Yikes. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I perceive that it came forth from God. It's again the idea of the godly will recognize the godly, and the ungodly cannot recognize the godly. Um, I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. This time he's more specific. <laughs> I'm not beating around the bush. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. That one's clear. Thank you, Jesus. That's thrown down the gauntlet right there. You say, you're the army of darkness. I'm part of the army of light. So we're not going to get each other. We speak in a different language. Um, but because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Well, we don't know if they possibly repented. But there's one or two places where he said, if you don't come and believe in me, you will remain in your sin. Which at least has the implication. You still have a chance while you're alive, but the only path that is salvation is through me. So they have to overcome their objection to Jesus because he, he no one comes to the Father except through me. He's the gateway to salvation. And as, as the apostles point out, there's no salvation apart from Jesus. St. Peter. But this is before he was crucified. Right. Yeah. So, but that means the question to me is, yeah, you're, you're, you, they're dead today, but once he was crucified and if he believed in his father, do they not have their way to heaven? It has to be through Jesus. And it has to be while you're still alive in this world. There's no chance of conversion after you're dead. So the time of mercy is between the bookends of your conception and your natural death. But if you come around to accept him, salvation is possible. That, that's not the question, though, Pastor. What? Because he's talking, he's talking right now before the crucifixion. And he's yes. talking to people that, that supposedly are believing in his father. Correct? So, yeah, so, so once he's crucified and that door is opened to all believers, rather they believe in him or in the Father, is that not right? I, it's not the way I would phrase it. I would just say, rather than the door opening, the door closes when you're dead. I mean, they're still around. They have a chance to change their opinion. They have time uh, to repent, to convert, to come to the light. But he's already... Just for the note, though, it's worth saying, he's already speaking uh, indirectly about his crucifixion because in verse 28 he said, when Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am He. Uh, and it's almost a quote from the Roman soldier who says, truly, this is the Son of God. You know, when the temple curtain tears and the eclipse happens and people are rising out of tombs. Yeah, but... As long as you're alive, the message is you have time for conversion. It's the, the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Like the Satan sows the weeds among the field and they're so embarrassed the employees they want to volunteer to tear the whole field up. And Jesus says, no, let it all grow because right now it's all young, they all kind of look alike. You might pull out some of the wrong plants. So let it grow till harvest time. Then we'll separate out the chaff from the wheat. That's a that's a metaphor for life. That while, while I'm alive, I'm in the time of mercy. And even if I show up at the vineyard at the last half hour, I still receive the coin from the labor of salvation. So, but, but yeah. I think what Doug is saying is that the Jews today do not believe in Jesus Christ. 
Who said believe in God? Is that is what she's saying? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the point I was, I was trying to get to because you know I understand he's saying that to the to these Jews that before Christ is crucified, so there's everybody's on an equal on the same plane oh, until the crucifixion. Let me thank you for that clarification because I think it helped. He's not speaking to all Jews past, present, and future that makes this comment. He's speaking to this particular crowd. Those specific people. Um, catechism speaks about people who are of other faiths. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, we have a prayer in, our, in the Mass for those whose faith is known to you alone. That's God's business. That's God's job description. I don't know how He sorts it out. I happen to be of the belief that, uh, you know, when God makes covenants, He keeps them, He's faithful to them. So I believe the Jews have their own covenants still. Um, as His chosen people, you know, there are people who are born in the deep Amazon jungle, you know, they have, they, they don't have any divine revelation, they have just their conscience. People have different resource materials they're working from. God has a fair, just plan, an merciful plan for each person. But in the end, we are responsible for our own moral decisions. And the only thing I can say definitively, I don't know the details of how it works, but we believe, we maintain that every person Whoever exists will receive sufficient grace for salvation. However that works, you will have a fair chance to make a choice for salvation. No one will be able to stand before God. We're not Calvinists, so we don't say, oh, you created me for hell. What a ripoff. Mm -hmm. No? Boy, you didn't help me. I saw you helped this guy with a bunch of grace. I didn't get any grace. I got in the grace line there. They ran out by the time I was there. <laughs> I want to redo. You know? Every one of us, no one will be able to judge the extent before God and blame God and say, you, you set me up with a chancy deal. I have a good chance here. You know, every, every one of us has an opportunity because God created us for heaven. That's our true home. In fact, it's a continuous, it's a constant invitation. We're surrounded by grace with that. So don't read into it. This is my statement to all people who are of the Jewish faith. No, it's this crowd of opponents that he's speaking with. And the church said as much too. They said, don't blame the Jews for killing Christ. It's not a burden every Jew has to carry. It's specific people who do specific crimes, you know? Mm -hmm. If that helps, I don't know. filled with a series of little yeses that leads to the big yes, hopefully. And the more yeses you give, the more likely you'll get the right answer at the end. Uh, but, you know, don't don't leave it from the end and all of a sudden say, pop quiz, oh no, I didn't say it. <laughs> you know, we're, we're meant, you know, intentional ignorance is not a defense. Um, anyway. So the only unforgivable sin is the one of total rejection of God. Yes. Catechism talks about this when the scripture speaks about the unforgivable sin. The, un the unforgivable sin is final obstinacy toward God's invitation. Because that urging is the Holy Spirit. So if you are perpetually saying no to the Holy Spirit's urging your whole life and you exit this world still saying no, the reason it's unforgivable, by the way, for clarification, is not some limitation or weakness of God. It's because I mean, God can forgive any sin, but it requires us to receive the forgiveness, to, to accept it. And if we don't want it, he's offering us a gift and we won't take it. That's why it's unforgivable. So final obstinacy of repent, you know, to refuse to repent, that is the sin of the Holy Spirit. God is, is mercy. And just again, go back to the woman caught in adultery. There's a picture of perfect picture of Jesus. You know, he comes to heal us. He comes to, he wants us to fall in love with him. That's it. But you can't force somebody through fear or a stick. It depends on the sales. So, um, we're going to stop there. Um, he does have some, a couple more comments about Abraham, but I think we'll have to save it for next time. Um, and then we'll just continue forward. So just please keep reading.
And just a reminder again, tomorrow, this time, or at 5.30, if I was a simple Catholic, you'll have a lot more questions like this about every given subject under the sun. So, come check it out. Let me just say this, for, for clarity on that class. It is not for people who are wanting to become Catholic. That remains RCIA. That's the proper class for you. And it's not a place, we're not intending to have a debate. So if you have a friend who's not Catholic, I've always had an open invitation for people who want to come. As long as they understand, with due respect, we're going to be presenting the Catholic position. So it's not a class of debate. I'm going to, I took a oath to teach and present the Catholic faith as accurately as possible, handed down to the apostles. That's what I'm going to attempt to do. Uh, but I do welcome questions as we try to clarify and get a deeper understanding of our faith. So hopefully you might be on the journey. Pray for me if you can't be a part of it. Um, that we do a decent job. And we just close with glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and it is now and it shall be. Lord, I am.